Well, good morning. Um, one of the things that uh, has always amazed me when visiting the homes of Muslims is how seriously they take the Quran. They keep the Quran wrapped up in a green cloth, put it on a top shelf, and never look at it. Because it is such a holy book, you can't touch it. And uh, we have the Bible. And it's actually a holier book. We don't wrap it up in green cloths. We don't put it on the top shelf. But if we're honest, sometimes it does stay on the shelf when we should be reading it. An RE teacher asked a pupil, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? I didn't, sir. I was away last week. <laughs> so the teacher went to the head teacher. Who knocked down the walls of Jericho, he asked. I'm not sure, said the head. I'll come back to you on that. The head wrote to the Minister of Education. Who knocked down the walls of Jericho? Eventually he got the reply. You just get the wall rebuilt and we'll see someone pays for it. <laughs> A bit tongue-in-cheek, but actually that sums up an awful lot of the knowledge of the Bible nowadays in this country. In the church, as well as outside the church, if we're honest. I was talking to some students from uh, another college. Fortunately, the college doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was a very liberal Anglican college. And uh, uh, one of the students quoting their principle said, The Bible is just like Winnie the Pooh. It's just what you get out of it, which uh, seemed to me to be <laughs> inadequate response to what is the Bible. There are those who say, well, the Bible is just like any other book. You really ought to try reading so-and-so. Well, what about this Bible? Can we have confidence in the Bible yeah. in the age in which we live? Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> Well, first of all, as we're just going to start looking at the Bible, uh, hopefully, no, I probably haven't turned it on, that's probably the problem. No, it's on. It just doesn't want to respond. Oh, that's the wrong end of the story. Right. <laughs> the Bible. Okay, let's see if we can get to it now. Uh, the Bible is uniquely popular. 44 million Bibles are sold every year. An article in the Times said, forget the modern British novelists and TV tie-ins, the Bible is the biggest selling book every year. So, so when you go into a bookshop and they say, these are, the top, you know, these are the top sellers, they don't put the Bible in because it would be in every week. The Bible is the top seller by several miles. This is, um, have I got this right? Yeah, this is the article from the Times. Forget the modern British novelists and the TV Times. The Bible is the best selling book every year. As usual, the top seller by several miles was the Bible. It's cumulative cumulative sales of the Bible were frankly reflected in bestseller lists, it would be a rare week when anything else would achieve a look-in. Wow. It is wonderful, weird, or just plain baffling in this increasingly godless age, when the range of books available grows wider with each passing year, that this one book should go on selling hand over fist, month in, month out. It is estimated that nearly 1.2 Five million Bibles and testimonies are sold in the UK alone every year. Great to see that in the Times. <laughs> but, um, the writer ends what they had to say by saying all versions of the Bible sell well all the time. Can the Bible Society offer an explanation? Well, I am told disarmingly, it is such a good book. <laughs> so if this Bible is, uh, boom. sorry, I hadn't put the words up for you. The Bible is uniquely popular. It is also uniquely powerful. 
the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin said the Bible is a high explosive but it works in strange ways and no living man can tell or know how that book in its journey through the world has startled the individual soul in 10,000 different places into a new life, a new world, a new belief, a new conception, a new faith. There is a growing interest today in spirituality and people will even turn to the occult for that. God offers a real spirituality to use the metaphor of Star Wars, the good side rather than the dark side. So the Bible is uniquely popular. It is uniquely powerful. It is also uniquely precious. I visited Romania most years during the 90s following the revolution. After my first visit, when I was greatly moved by what I saw and experienced, I started um, facilitating the visits of others with material and spiritual aid. Several times this was done by taking a coach with about 20 people on board and the rest of the coach and all the hold filled with aid. Even the toilet on one trip got filled with stuff. <laughs> After visiting one particular church, the young people started giving out copies of the Bible in Romanian at the door of the coach. They were mobbed by people desperate to have a copy of this book. One youngster commented afterwards, now I know what Michael Jackson feels like. <laughs> I've seen several people standing in the middle of the road reading a Bible that they've just received while the traffic goes past them on either side, desperate for their first look at this wonderful book. I have seen grown men burst into tears when receiving a copy of this amazing book. Now, this book has been written by many different people Approximately 40 different people write the pages of what we know as the Bible. It was not written in one place in the ancient world. It was written in Rome, in the West, in Egypt, in the South, in Mesopotamia, in the East. There is ethnic diversity as well as geographical diversity, which distinguishes it from all other books amazing book nothing else like it in the world so why do we not have confidence in it why do we not read it every day why are we not devouring this book when others gave their lives to make sure that not only was the bible available to us but it was available in english for us <laughs> now st paul's cathedral who built St. Paul's Cathedral? Wren. Well done. Educated people. Christopher Wren. Actually, many people built St. Paul's Cathedral. He was the architect. He was on site making sure the right bricks put, put in the right place. But there was a lot of people building it. And it's the same with the Bible. The Bible is God's book. But he used more than 40 people to put it together. To make sure they put the right bits in the right place. Now, Christianity is unique. Sorry, C.S. Lewis said, The Son of Man became a man to enable men to become sons of God. I like that quote. The Son of Man became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Well, Christianity is unique in its offer of salvation by grace alone, a free gift from God to anyone who will receive it. Now, when you look at Islam, as I've already mentioned, which claims to be an heir of the biblical tradition, 
It is not a religion of grace and redemption. Muslims believe that paradise is a just reward and hell a rightful punishment. It is a common Islamic belief that two angels follow each Muslim through life. The angel on the person's right records his or her good deeds, while the angel on the left records the bad deeds. A bit like, do you remember the Tom and Jerry cartoons with the two angels on either side? <laughs> <coughs> the balance in the scale decides if you go to paradise or hell. There is no assurance. There is no grace. And there are other religions in the world that have copied Islam and taken that same approach. Hallelujah, that actually God reveals grace and mercy to us. But let's look at the origins of the Bible for a moment. Um, some of you may recognise this guy on the, whichever side it is, this one here, for those of you who are old enough to remember such things. That's Paul Jones, who was um, the lead singer in Manfred Mann. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then in uh, the, 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 the blues band. <laughs> yeah. I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was on Luxembourg uh, and uh, uh, interviewing people. And uh, he's a lovely Christian guy. And this is a thing that he produced in conjunction with the Bible Society. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's hear some words of advice regarding the Bible from Paul Jones. This possibility of an almighty God inspiring people to write and put together his message for the human race makes this one of the most potentially exciting collections of information ever put together. But this sense of excitement doesn't always come across from everyone. I don't really think a lot of the Bible, to be honest. It's written such a long time ago. Obviously, over the years, different bits have been added and changed. It was sort of passed on generations and exaggerated. Down the years, it would be changed quite a lot. I wouldn't have thought it would be very accurate now. Stories tend to get changed over years, and it's been a hell of a lot of years since it was written. Well, how do we know it hasn't got changed en route? Have you got the originals? Right, caption that question, will you? I've been looking into this. No, we haven't got any of the originals, and we wouldn't expect to for something of that age. But what we do have is a strong history of documentation. Well, sounds good. Well, what does it mean? It means we've got a lot of written documents which provide strong evidence for what's in the original. Look, let's play around with the graphics on this micro. Take any historical event, a battle for instance. The general who won is proud of this achievement. He wants a permanent record, so he orders a scribe to write about it. He wants everyone else to know, so copies are made. Now let's look at a central event in the Bible, the life of Jesus. Accounts were written with particular people in mind. They decided the contents should be passed on. So copies were made, and copies of copies. Some wore out, some were lost, including the originals. So, as they would do for any other writing of a similar age, historians work from the copies we have. Let's see how they do it. This line represents years from 500 BC to AD 1600. When historians try to piece together evidence for the original, they look for two things, the number of good copies and the time gap between the oldest existing copy and the date of the original. You remember Julius Caesar? Oh yes, close friends. Shortly before the books of the New Testament were written, he wrote accounts of some of his wars. We have 10 copies. The oldest is dated by historians about the year 900. That's a gap of around a thousand years. Or take Plato, another famous name from the past. He wrote his books of philosophy some three or four hundred years BC. The earliest existing manuscript is dated around AD 900. So the time gap is roughly 1200 years and we have only seven copies. But in both cases, historians still believe that's reasonable evidence. Most of the books of the New Testament were written in the second part of the first century AD. 
we have part of a manuscript dated only 60 to 70 years later and full manuscripts only 250 years later. And if that sounds impressive, look at the number of copies we have. This is an estimation. Some say there could easily be more. Hmm, impressive. But why were there so many copies of the New Testament? Well, it's always been a bestseller, perhaps because it sees something more in life than what's immediately obvious, and that's always meant something to people. Hmm, well, I suppose if you're going to copy that lot by hand, you've got to believe it's important. Yes, and not just copy it with your feet up while you're thinking about something else, either. Nowadays, we can get a document copied by just pressing a button, but it hasn't always been like that. If it's the number of New Testament manuscripts that's impressive, when we turn to the Old Testament, it's the extraordinary care which we know the scribes took with their work. This is a Hebrew scroll of the first five books of the Bible. If you unrolled it fully, it would stretch over a hundred feet. It contains 69,000 words. You imagine copying out that lot by hand in neat, regular letters like this, using a quill pen and a pot of charcoal and vegetable oil. It makes 500 lines look like a complete let-off. In fact, at a recent exhibition, visitors were invited to help copy out parts of the Bible. Over 2,000 people took part, with an average of 10 working at one time. In 30 hours, they completed about a quarter of the total length, and the standard of handwriting and general presentation doesn't quite match up. For the Hebrew scrolls of the Old Testament had to be without any mistake or blemish. One mistake meant beginning a whole new skin, so if you went wrong here, you would have to go right back to there. And if the mistake involved the name of God, the whole thing had to be discarded and begun again. What's more, the checking was incredibly strict. Some of the scribes used complicated safeguards to make sure nothing was left out, like counting all the verses, words and letters in each book, and sometimes even counting how many times each letter of the alphabet occurred in each book. I know it all sounds amazing, but they saw their work as no ordinary copying exercise. These were writings inspired by God, and this is the way they showed reverence for them. Later Christians came to see the Gospels and the other books now in the New Testament as inspired in the same way. But we can do better than just say they were very careful. We can compare the results. Let's go back and look at the old family tree of documents. Take two copies from the branches of the tree. If they are to all intents and purposes the same, we can assume they come from the same source. Now, if they're on branches a long way apart, and still highly similar, we can assume the common source is a long way back. And the accuracy has been maintained over a lot of copies in between. Yes, but how do we know they've not just been copied from each other? Partly because we know where they came from. A number of cities around the Mediterranean became important centers of learning. The branches of our tree spread to and out from these rather distant cities. We know that because each city had its own style which today's scholars recognize. Rather as you would recognize, I came from a different place from somebody else. If I spoke like this and he spoke like that. We don't expect the copies to match exactly. In fact, the small differences in the text, like the way place names are spelled, are one of the ways scholars use to identify the city but they're a great deal more similar than they are different, and in very few places does the difference affect the meaning at all. We've got a good quote from Sir Frederick Kenyon. He used to be director of the British Museum. No other ancient book has anything like such early and plentiful testimony to its text, and no unbiased scholar would deny that the text that has come down to us is substantially sound. What he's saying is that for no other similar writings is there such strong evidence that what we've got today is the same to all intents and purposes as the originals. And from a director of the British Museum, that must mean something. Well, there's obviously been a lot of research done on this. The age of the document seems pretty important. How do we find that out? Well, a little bit of science and a little bit of day-to-day -day observation. Yeah, if you can take all of that in. It goes on and starts talking about carbon dating, and it also talks about the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
and how everyone thought when they were found it was going to prove that the Bible documents were not right. Quite the contrary. <coughs> Finding the Dead Sea Scrolls has shown the, uh, how the, the Old Testament is valid. Um, so I hope you found that helpful because you see this book that we can treat too lightly at times because we're we're so used to it and we have so many copies of it and so many translations. This book is so important. This is God's word for us. We shouldn't treat it lightly. You see, through the Bible, God speaks to those who are not yet Christians. People who read it and discover that... Um, it is the living word that is still capable of changing people's lives. Uh, some of you will probably know this man, who's the little grey cells, uh, David Suchet, who of course played Poirot. Well, here's some words from him. From somewhere I got this desire to read the Bible again. That's the most important part of my conversion. I started with the Acts of the Apostles and then moved to Paul's letters, Romans and Corinthians. And it was only after that that I came to the Gospels. In the New Testament, I suddenly discovered the way that life should be followed. The Bible is still such an important start for people to discover God through his word. But if it's a book that speaks to uh, not yet Christians, it's also the book that speaks to Christians. As we read the Bible, we experience a transforming relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who is the living word. Spending time in God's presence, reading his word, brings many blessings. He often brings joy and peace especially in times of crisis in our lives. He gives guidance and assurance. You know, as I have said here recently, a quick couple of minutes with this book cannot balance the hours spent on our phones, magazines and our TVs. People died to let us have this book in our own language. Let us have confidence in it and read it. It is the sword of the Spirit. You know, how many of you have read Lord of the Rings? Yeah? You know, there are 550,000 words in Lord of the Rings, which is three times more than there is in the whole of the New Testament. You know, and people sit down and read the Lord of the Rings. Well, the New Testament's only a third of that size. And yet, we don't read it. You know, there are 1,084,000 words in the seven Harry Potter books combined. The Bible, complete, has only 783,000 words, which makes the Potter books over a third longer than the whole of the Bible. And people say, oh, the Bible's so long. <laughs> You know, with apologies that I haven't got the UK statistics, there are nearly 1,000 different cookbooks published in America every year. That's about 20 million copies every year. But at the same time, fewer and fewer people are actually cooking. One lady who was interviewed admitted that she had purchased 16 cookbooks in the last four years. But the last time she prepared a sit-down meal was four years ago. There are more Bible translations, study aids, and devotional books now than ever before. But people are reading and studying their Bibles less and less. This is the greatest book in the world. Other books were given for our information. The Bible was given for our transformation. We should treasure it. We should have confidence in it. We should read it. 
And maybe if you go away with nothing else today, go away knowing that this Bible is proven. It has stood the test of time. You should have confidence in it and you should read it. And if you haven't read it much recently, as we pause and pray, maybe you should be saying to God, yes, Lord, I intend this week to start reading this book more seriously and letting it speak to me. Let's pray.